Center and holds the eminent scholar chair in telemedicine at the Medical College of Georgia. In addition, he's a senior research scientist at the Georgia Institute of Technology and a member of the board of directors, a founding member as well, president-elect of the American Telemedicine Association and senior advisor to NASA on telemedicine. He also has a medical degree from Harvard Medical School, magna cum laude. He spent the majority of his professional career involved in teaching healthcare research and for over 27 years the development of interactive telecommunications as a means of addressing the problems related to quality, cost, and access to care that now plagues our healthcare system. Dr. Sanders has designed the telemedicine system at the Medical College of Georgia and is overseeing the implementation of a statewide telemedicine system that interfaces with rural hospitals, public health facilities, correctional institutions, and ambulatory health centers. Finally, a project, he's also in working on a project called Electronic House Calls that's being developed for the next generation of telemedicine. I'd like to introduce Dr. Jay Sanders. Thank you very much, and it's a real pleasure to be back to Oklahoma. I think I spend more time in Oklahoma than I do in Georgia. Um, and every time I come, I learn uh, more and more. Um, it's just fascinating and exciting uh, to see what your state has done in such an incredibly short period of time. What I would like to do over the next 40 to 50 minutes is give you a snapshot of where we think healthcare delivery will be by the year 2000. But in providing you that snapshot of how the healthcare delivery system will change, I would like to suggest to you that what we are looking at in healthcare is really simply one component of how our entire societal interactions uh, will change uh, over the next five to 10 years. And although it is occurring in a very subtle way, it's an incredibly powerful thing that is happening. And what I would like to suggest is that what happened during the Industrial Revolution, in which there was a tremendous migration from rural America to urban America, will be totally reversed by the information revolution and the great advances that are occurring in terms of telecommunications. Because with the availability of telecommunications and our ability to bring all services to the point of need, whether it is healthcare, banking, shopping, or entertainment, to wherever you are, regardless of your geographic location, the reality is that there will be a significant migration of people from the cluttered, dirty, traffic-ridden urban communities to more rural America. For those of you who live in urban communities, that might seem ideal. For those of you who live in rural communities, that may not seem quite ideal. Because while rural America will substantially gain economically from the changes that will occur in commerce and banking and entertainment and healthcare, you will also begin to get a feel for what folks in urban communities have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and that is traffic. I have visited a number of communities in Nebraska recently that a number of years ago had the foresight to lay fiber and telecommunication infrastructure into their communities in a desperate attempt to try and stop the outward migration uh, of the people from their towns. And what they have found, quite dramatically, is what everybody has predicted will occur relative to telecommunication infrastructure. And that is the fact that now, not, all, not only are they not losing people from their community, their populations have not only stabilized, they are increasing. And when it's fascinating to sit down and discuss with some of the people who have lived in these communities uh, since the 60s and 70s, who tell you that there is no longer any um, unemployment in town, and that the economy of the town is growing rapidly. And they tell you that part with a smile on their face, 
and then they begin to discuss with you the other impact of that, and the other impact of that is for them to tell you, and here you're in this small little community where there may only be a thousand people in the community, um, and only one Wendy's or only one McDonald's and one Pizza Hut, and these people are telling you, when you ask them where they live, they say, oh, well, we don't live in town. Uh, we live much further out. And I'm saying to myself, what could be much further out than where we are right now? And I say, well, why do you live much further out? They say, well, we can't afford the prices of homes now in our community. They said 10 years ago, it was easy for us to live in this community. It was easy, easy for us to buy the 10 acre or the 100 acre farm. Now, in order to, to purchase that, they have to go far outside of town and it takes them a half an hour to drive into this rural community town. It's just fascinating. And they're suddenly beginning to see something called rush hour traffic. So there's a tremendous amount of sociological changes that will occur. Um, and there is going to be a very distinct blurring of the boundaries that now exist between what we identify as urban and what we identify as rural. And by the way, much to the dismay of the urban communities, because if you look at um, an urban community like New York City, and you see what is happening in New York City with major companies moving out and moving into small rural communities that have a communication infrastructure, what is happening is that the tax base that the mayors had to literally repair their roads and to repair their, uh, their bridge infrastructure is now being lost. So urban mayors and rural mayors uh, are going to be dealing with significant changes based upon the revolution in telecommunications. And what I'd like to do is to share with you what that impact will be on healthcare delivery. And in order to do that, and let me just look around the projector. To really give you a glimpse of the future healthcare delivery system, we've got to go back 74 years. So anybody who says what I'm about to um, talk to you about is futuristic, please remember this slide. This is the front cover to a magazine printed in London, England. This happens to be the American edition, as you can tell from the fact that it's 25 cents. And the name of the magazine was Radio News. This was printed in April of 1924, and it shows our modern electronic house call. What it is, is a young boy at home showing his soft throat to his physician through what we would call today his multimedia platform called a radio. And the physician, looking at that young boy soft road through his multimedia platform called a radio. And the reason we know this has to be a radio is we did not have TV until 1929. The Jules Verne of telemedicine was probably the editor of this news magazine, H. Gertzbach, who when we did some research, we found out that he was a fairly well-known science fiction writer in the 20s and 30s. Well, what we need to do, and what we're doing right now in Georgia and what you're doing in Oklahoma, is migrating to this electronic household. And the first phase of the migration is a hospital-to-hospital -hospital telemedicine system. This is a system that presently exists in the state of Georgia that you have here in the state of Oklahoma. It is just one type of technology that can be used. I want to point out that the technology is totally off-the-shelf technology. There is nothing special about it. This is standard telecommunications and information processing technology that you and I utilize on a day-to-day -day basis, but in totally different aspects 
of our daily life. Now we're simply applying this technology to healthcare. And the particular system that I'll demonstrate here is one that was based upon doing an end user analysis of what the rural community physicians in Georgia wanted. And our initial focus in terms of this first phase was to address the problems relative to the rural health care issues in the state of Georgia. But the rural health care issues in Georgia were basically the same as exist every place else in the country. And very briefly, what we found was that rural hospitals were dying in the state of Georgia. And the reason they were dying was that their fiscal stability was being undermined by the fact that their medical staff was made up of generalists. The medical staff did not have such specialists, and most rural communities cannot support having specialists. An interventional cardiologist or a neurosurgeon cannot survive in a small rural community. The population dynamics do not justify that. They are all in the secondary and tertiary care centers. But you as a patient who require that type of expertise can't get it in the rural hospital. You have to be transferred from that facility to a secondary and tertiary care center, and that immediately impacts the fiscal stability of that hospital because it decreases the bed census and the ambulatory revenue from that hospital. The other thing that we found quite dramatically was the fact that a dying hospital in rural America basically meant a dying community. While in a larger city, if a, if a community hospital went under, it would certainly impact the employees of that hospital. It wouldn't impact that community. In fact, in made, many major urban communities in this country, a community hospital going under would actually improve the healthcare delivery system of that community. And the reason for that is these communities are so overbedded. But in a rural community, if you look at who is the major employer in town, many times it turns out that the rural hospital is the major employer in town. And therefore, a dying hospital meant a dying community. We also found, of course, the whole issue of professional isolation. And I've commented on this many, many times, and I'm not ashamed to continue to underline this, and that is the fact that we have a ridiculous medical education system in this country. All physicians are basically trained in major academic medical centers. We become addicted to our subspecialty colleagues and all the high technology that's available to us during our house staff residency and fellowship training. And then we cut our educational umbilical cord, we go out into the real world, where we have access to neither the colleagues nor the high technology. That kind of professional isolation is quite clear. But one of the things we were also very attuned to, if not very sensitive to, was the flip side of that coin, and that is the fact that it's not simply the rural-based physician that's professionally isolated. It's the academic-based physician who is professionally isolated. And the reason I say that is I use myself as an example. I've spent my entire professional career in academic medicine as a teacher. You give me a patient who's acutely ill, a patient with acute renal failure, a patient with multi-system organ failure, and I have no problem taking care of that patient. But tomorrow you put me out in rural America, and I wouldn't have the slightest idea how to open up a practice. And I don't mean from the standpoint of the administrative aspects. I mean from the standpoint of taking care of the patients that come into my office. I probably have to wait till the patient became acutely ill until I can take care of them. <laughs> and the irony of this whole system is I'm the one teaching the person who ends up in the real world. We needed to do something about the professional isolation on both sides of the point. The issue of continuing medical education. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars a year in this country on continuing medical education. And it is neither continuous nor education. You know, we make a great point that we need to increase the number of primary care physicians in this country. That we have too many subspecialists, we don't have enough primary care physicians. Well, quite candidly, I'm not as much concerned about the quantity of primary care physicians that we have out there as I am sustaining the quality of those primary care physicians. <coughs> if we double the number of primary care physicians in the graduating class this year from all medical schools, 
how good are they going to be five years from now if we don't have an effective continuing medical education system? We now have twice as many bad physicians as we had before. And I'm trying to make that point and underline that point. Uh, perhaps I'm overdoing it, but the reality is that the doctor who graduated from medical school, say 10 years ago, who we consider a young physician in the community, was taught that a patient who has congestive heart failure or a patient who has diabetes with hypertension, well, let's take the patient with congestive heart failure, should be treated with digitalis. And the patient with diabetes and hypertension should be started off on a diuretic and a beta blocker. That was totally appropriate 10 years ago. Well, that's totally wrong today. You don't do that anymore. Now, the doctor that you're seeing who's still doing that from 10 years ago is practicing good medicine in terms of what he learned 10 years ago, but it's changed. And he or she has not had the time, because they're so overworked, and we have not had the effective system to maintain them in terms of their medical expertise. And unfortunately, many of us have seen patients who would have been better off if they had never seen a physician in the first place. We've got to do something about continuing medical education. Continuing medical education literally occurs at the wrong time and the wrong place by the wrong people. If I'm a rural-based physician listening to your heart right now, and I hear an abnormal murmur, I can't wait six months from now to sit in a medical school classroom to be lectured to by a cardiologist. They're generally lecturing to me about what their interests are, not what my needs are. And even if they address my needs, they're occurring totally out of time sequence in terms of my patient and in terms of my needs. I retain information when I have a question in my mind and that question is immediately answered. You know when that happened? That happened when I was a house officer. And I was listening to that patient's heart and I didn't know whether that mitral murmur I was listening to related to a floppy mitral valve or what we call hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I got an answer to that question immediately by my attending at the bedside saying, Jay, let me tell you why I think it's mitral valve prolapse. That's when I retained my information. We've got to establish a system that creates for the physician an immediate feedback, an immediate interchange in terms of a question that they have in their mind. And the final thing that we noted, which was quite dramatic and a significant impact on, our, on the economics of healthcare delivery, was the fact that in rural Georgia today, it would cost you $1,150 per day to be a patient. If I transferred you to the Medical College of Georgia to see a dermatologist or to see a neurologist, that per average day cost escalates to $1,850 a day. A huge differential in cost just because I've transferred you from one bed to another. Nothing more. And I don't include in that differential the cost of transportation, the cost of loss of productivity, and the cost of delay in therapy. Because if you're a sick patient today, and I know I've got to get you to a specialist, and I can't get you to that specialist until tomorrow, the likelihood is you're going to be a sicker patient tomorrow and require increased hospitalization days. So based upon that analysis of the rural healthcare system in Georgia in late 1990 and early 1991, we came up with this system. This is a system that allows for total interactivity between the specialist at the Medical College of Georgia and the patient at a remote site. The remote site here happens to be 130 miles away from the Medical College of Georgia in a town called Eastman, Georgia, and this is in Dodge County Hospital. But with that said, please recognize that distance is totally transparent and seamless with a digital communication infrastructure similar to the one that you're developing here in Oklahoma. And that is the patient could be 13,000 miles away. It would not matter at all. In the scenario that we have here, this is real time. So there is total interactivity as if this patient were actually in the room with the physician back at the Medical College of Georgia. Now, do we think that this is the be all and end all of telemedicine? No, not at all. If all we needed, for instance, in terms of doing our analysis at the remote site, for instance, 
was dermatologic expertise. We don't need 30 frames per second full motion interactivity. We just need, for instance, a still frame. We could use the Picasso uh, telephone, picture telephone uh, system for that. Or we could use a good desktop uh, computer uh, with a little camera on top of that and do a store forward type of technology. There are multiple variations of the technology and the technology does not dictate the system. It's the end user's needs that dictate what the technology will be. This was our solution based upon what we were told their needs were. Now, with totally off-the-shelf technology, I will show you how we can do a complete examination of the patient even though the patient is a thousand miles away. Here our cardiologist is using an electronic stethoscope to listen to that patient's heart and lung sounds. In fact, this cardiologist can do a complete examination, which I will show you shortly, and also review the chest x-ray. This is a chest x-ray that's been flipped up on the x-ray view box in the emergency department at Dodge County Hospital, 130 miles away. And our cameras zoom in on it. That's one of the options that we have. Or we could directly digitize this x-ray and send it to us. We can review the EKG, we can review the cardiac ultrasound. And in fact, what we do is we capture the entire consultative exchange. Think about the impact of that. When this patient comes back two weeks from now, I don't simply have my medical record where I'm trying to read my illegible writing. I have a complete audio-visual record of this patient. So if I want to listen to what this patient's heart sounds sounded like before I initiated therapy with what it sounds like today after therapy, I could just look at my captured consultative exchange, and I've got it. Everything, by the way, that's put on this screen, although it's in real time, we can freeze frame. So let's assume I have a child who's just had uh, some trauma to his or her eye from a farming accident, some blood trauma, and I'm concerned about retinal detachment. And the child's eye is constantly moving, and I have my ophthalmoscope here at MCG, and I'm trying to look at um, that child's eye at Dodge County Hospital and the eye is constantly moving and I see something on the retina, I can immediately freeze frame that. So I now have a still image of it and I've got it captured and I can send it and transfer it to my PC and store it. Well, let me go back a second and point out something which is unusual in this slide in terms of what normally happens in terms of a patient being seen by a specialist and that's this individual. This individual happens to be the primary care physician who has referred that patient to the specialist. Now the reason that's unusual is that in the usual everyday uh, type of medical practice in which I send my patient to a specialist, I don't accompany my patient to the specialist. I don't have the time to do that. I stay in my office while I'm seeing the rest of my patients while my patient goes off to see the specialist. And this physician is not required in terms of the functioning of the system. All you need literally is a secretary at the site with the patient. But one of the fascinating and one of the exciting things about what has happened is that the majority of our primary care physicians have chosen to spend the extra time to accompany their patient at the time the patient is being examined by the subspecialist. And to me, the reason it's exciting is because this is really the second greatest strength of the system. Yes, we have brought a specialist immediately to that patient. But as importantly, we have brought a colleague to that patient's physician. And that primary care physician is listening to that patient's heart and lung sounds at the same time the cardiologist is. And if she has a question about what she is hearing, she gets immediate feedback from the cardiologist. That is one-on-one -on -one continuing medical education. That is effective continuing medical education. Now very quickly, I'd like to go through the technology of the system because the technology of the system is not important. 
but just to give you an idea of what off-the-shelf technology can do. Here is our primary care physician at the remote site with her patient with the specialist back at the medical center. Here we have the capability for both physicians at both sites to annotate, to literally write on the various graphics. So here the cardiologist has circled the aortic knob and is explaining to the primary care physician that he thinks there's something going on there. She at her site can do the same thing and she can say, I think there's some problem here at the left base of the lung and draw a line there so that he sees exactly what it is that she's concerned about. This is our capture capability. This is somewhat, a lot of people would say, this is an archaic technology. It's a simple VCR. We have one at both ends. Why is it in the more high-tech optical disk storage? Why is it in holographic storage? Well, because one of the things we also try and do in this system is to marry the best technology with the best economics. And we do very well by capturing the entire consultative exchange with the VCR. And it would be more expensive for us in terms of storage capacity to do this on optical disk storage. This, in fact, as I have shown you, this becomes our risk management quality insurance. In the southeastern part of the United States, if you analyze why physicians lose malpractice cases, in 80% of the time that they lose those cases, it's not because they didn't do what they were supposed to do. They did do it. They just never, ever documented it. And if they didn't document it, it wasn't done. That's the way the courts rule. This will document exactly what the physician does. And of course, if this shows something that the physician did that was wrong, we just shred that tape. <laughs> These are the controls to our electronic stethoscope. At its very worst, it is as good as your cardiologist stethoscope at the bedside with you. This is just a fax machine. This is sort of a redundant piece of equipment. And the reason this is put in is in case my specialist is not computer literate. What we do is we ask our specialists after they have examined the patient and discussed the patient to immediately send over a consultative note, and that gets incorporated into the patient's chart at the distant site. So there's no loss of continuity in terms of information exchange. And assuming our physician is computer literate, she will vote him over that note. But if she's not, we ask her to write or dictate a note, and we fax it out to the remote site. And as a final step, we have a number of medical databases that we use in which we pull out the contents uh, from a reference source relating to the particular diagnosis that we have just made on the patient. So if I've just seen this patient and I think the patient has, for instance, mitral valve prolapse, and that patient with mitral valve prolapse has some regurgitated blood flow from the left ventricle into the left atrium, I know that that patient needs to be on antibiotic prophylaxis prior to any kind of surgical procedure, including something as simple as having his teeth cleaned. Well, what I do, I just discuss the case, examine the, the patient uh, with the doctor. I've just sent a consultative note. And now what I do is from our library of medical data, we send the most up-to-date reference and content, for instance, on antibiotic prophylaxis for mitral valve prolapse. And that gets modem or faxed out to the remote site and immediately incorporated into the patient's chart. Now, because of what we have just done with that primary care physician of examining the patient, discussing the patient, sending a note, and also sending a reference, we can now provide that primary care physician what is called Category 1 Continuing Medical Education Credit. For those of you who are not physicians, you need to realize that for me to get my license renewed on a yearly basis, I've got to show the professional licensing board that I have participated in a certain number of hours of Category 1 continuing medical education credit. The only way I get those credit hours now as a rural-based physician is literally to have to either close my practice or bring in a local tenant and travel off to the university and sit in a classroom to be lectured to for three or four days to accumulate those hours. 
That no longer happens at the sites that we have telemedicine in Georgia. They can get their continuing medical education credits right online at the time their consultant is examining their patient. Here's a standard document camera, so if we want to do the old-fashioned continuing medical education, we don't have to do it with the inconvenience of my specialist having to travel to all of the rural hospitals or the rural-based practitioners having to travel in to the medical center. With this simple document camera, my cardiologist here can lay down a bunch of a, um, EKGs, and as you can see, those EKGs are transmitted to the remote sites in the classroom where all the rural-based physicians are. They don't have to travel into MCG. She doesn't have to travel out to the rural hospitals. In addition, with this document camera, I can take one of my slides out of the carousel here, physically lay it down here, and with this camera, it will transmit as if I'm giving a, a slide presentation at the remote site. This little camera also gives us some redundancy in terms of our technology. Because if one of our patient examination cameras goes down, you can clearly see that that simple document camera does a very good job in terms of looking at skin lesions. You can see the fingerprints very, very nicely here. And on the flip side of that finger, there's a diagnostic lesion right here. This, by the way, is an artifact, but this white spot here is not. That white spot in the nail represents pitting of the nail. Now, as an isolated finding, it's not important. But in the particular case that we were looking at, it was very important. In fact, it was helped us in making the diagnosis. In fact, this was a patient who was a physician who self-referred himself over the system. The middle-aged physician who had developed plaque-like skin lesions on the extensive surfaces of his body over the past several months and over the past several weeks had developed some arthritis in this joint, which is called the distal interphalangeal joint. The combination of the skin lesions and that arthritis associated with this pitting of the nail confirmed for us a diagnosis of psoriasis with arthritis, so-called psoriatic arthropathy. Now, this device, which you have here in Oklahoma, was one which was suggested to us not by our technical people, not by me when I was designing the system, but suggested to us by one of the rural-based physicians when we went out to do the needs assessment. And this rural-based generalist said to me, he said, Jay, could you help me by having your gastroenterologist at the Medical College of Georgia do an endoscopy with me with my patients? And I looked at this primary care physician and I said, well, wait a minute, you're not endoscoping your patients, are you? This is obviously part of my naivete about what the real world is like. And he said, of course I am. I said, how in the world could you be doing that? I mean, you, you're not a gastroenterologist. You've never had any formal training in endoscopy. How could you do that? I said, if I did that in Augusta, Georgia, I'd have 10 plaintiff attorneys trying to break my door down, trying to get at me. He said, Jay, you need to realize that my patients, just either on a cultural, from a cultural standpoint or from an economic standpoint, won't go off, quote, to the big city medical center. They're afraid to leave town. They want to stay here in town. They want me to take care of them. I had to teach myself how to endoscope these patients. And in fact, he had. But now what he was asking for was for help. He said, I would love to have your gastroenterologist watch me put the tube into the oropharynx, down the esophagus, into the stomach, to look at how that beautiful pie looks in the stomach. <laughs> so what we did was we came up with the idea of using a camera that was generally used in what is called minimally invasive surgical technique, so-called laparoscopic surgery. And I apologize to the physicians in the room who are familiar with this, but for those of you who are not, I want you to know that if after lunch, after eating that pie, you get a gallbladder attack, and you go to the hospital today and have to have your gallbladder taken out, when your surgeon operates on you, he or she is no longer looking at you when they're operating on you. I mean, it was scary enough when they were looking at you. Now they're not even looking at you. What they're looking at is a TV monitor at the head of the OR table, where your head is, where the anesthetist is. And they're watching 
their hands move in your abdomen based upon pictures brought to this monitor by this camera which has been placed in your abdomen. They put four burr holes in your abdomen. And in the first burr hole, which is really the size of a band-aid, they put this camera, not with this great big thing on the end of it, but this part of it. And that goes in your abdomen. And it shows the surgeon what his instruments are doing. Well, we took this camera, and with an adapter, we found out that we could attach that camera to any scope. So your standard otoscope, ophthalmoscope, here's the otoscope, here is the adapter, here is the microscopical camera. Chuck Jones from Southwestern uh, Bell was showing me uh, variations uh, on the types of adapt adapters uh, that you folks are now using uh, here in Oklahoma that are very, very nice. Here you have your primary care physician at the rural hospital in Dodge County putting the otoscope in his patient's ear while our chief of ear, nose, and throat back at the medical center 130 miles away looking in that patient's middle ear. And what many of you who have seen this, and I would just suggest to all of you that you grab a hold of Chuck and make him show you this, and that is the fact that the picture of the middle ear on the TV monitor is totally better than the picture of the middle ear looking through the instrument directly. And it has become so much so that now our primary care physicians simply put the otoscope in the patient's ear and then look up at the TV monitor. This picture is a digital picture. So we can expand it, we can brighten it, we can better focus it. It's much better than looking directly at the ear. And in the same way, <coughs> excuse me, we can attach this to the ophthalmoscope. We can attach it, apropos of the request made by our generalist at Dodge County Hospital, to a gastroscope, or a colonoscope, or a bronchoscope, or a cystoscope, or an arthroscope, or a microscope. Here we have a slide under the scope. Here we have a Zeiss scope with a teaching head. This is the screw adapter on this. Here is our little camera, and here's our second opinion from the pathologist back at the medical center. In effect, this little inexpensive, off-the-shelf, handheld camera has become for us an electronic umbilical cord between the academic medical center and the remote healthcare facility. We have become part of their facility. They have become part of our facility. To give you an idea of the breadth of consultative exchanges that can occur over the system, here are the various subspecialists that have requested, that have been requested by the primary care physicians. The majority of them being in medicine, and the majority in medicine broken down in the subspecialty areas, the majority of them being in cardiology. And I guess the most important point to identify is the fact that since the introduction of this system, 86% of the patients that previously had to be transferred from the rural community to the secondary and tertiary care hospital are now being kept in the rural community. Translate that in terms of the $1,100 a day bed versus the $1,850 a day bed. Translate that in terms of what it means for the revenue stream of the rural hospital by keeping the patient and the revenue stream for the rural-based doctor in keeping the patient but also decreasing the overall cost of care to whoever is paying the bill. <clears throat> now when we started, as I mentioned, in November of 91, we started with a single hookup between the medical college and Dodge County Hospital in Eastman, Georgia. In mid-93, we added the other dark circle spots. And although I thought we were going to be completed uh, by the end of last year, it's probably now going to be into the fall of this year, we are completing a total statewide hookup based upon our initial results in Dodge County Hospital. And this hookup consists of 59 plus sites, made up of, as I will show you shortly, three tertiary care centers. I will mention two right now, one of them obviously the Medical College in Augusta and Emory in Atlanta. 
With three tertiary care centers, there are nine comprehensive secondary care facilities. These are comprehensive community hospitals that could handle just about anything the medical center could handle, and probably as well, except perhaps in the areas of burn therapy and transplantation. And from each of the tertiary care centers and the nine secondary hubs, we have three to four spokes going out to primary health care facilities in the state. Now the important thing about this network infrastructure that I plead that you do also in the state of Oklahoma is to make that infrastructure seamless. Because in effect, what has been done is that a patient at any location in the state can be seen and examined by a physician at any other location in the state. There is no difference in where you live in the state. You have total access to any of the expertise that exists in any other part of the state. Now, of course, what we ask for is for the system to maintain the integrity of the normal types of referral pattern. So we, for instance, ask the primary care physician up here in northwestern Georgia, if he's got a patient care problem and he needs a specialist, he should first access his subspecialty expertise in his secondary care hub in Dalton. And if Dalton has that subspecialty expertise to handle the problem, that's great. That's where it stops. But let's assume Dalton doesn't have that expertise, then that primary care physician and that patient up here in northwestern Georgia can be seen, for instance, by a specialist down here in southeastern Georgia. It makes no difference. And what we are all rapidly realizing is that what we are developing within our state is certainly not a statewide system. It is really an international system. It's certainly the next phase will be an interstate system so that Georgia and Oklahoma will be able to hook up together. It really doesn't matter. And as has been demonstrated recently, approximately six months ago at the request of NASA in Washington, we did a consultation using the Russian Luge satellite for a patient for Moscow State University School of Medicine. It didn't make any difference whether the patient was in rural Georgia or rural Georgia. It's one and the same. Now, as part of our first phase, we have hookups to rural hospitals, public health facilities, correctional facilities, and ambulatory care facilities. As a subset of our first phase, we were just funded by the Department of Defense to incorporate them into the statewide system, which is what you need to do. If you have a communication infrastructure, use it for everything and anything. Use it for banking, use it for commerce. Use it for everything that occurs within a hospital, not just medical care, use it for nursing and physiotherapy and occupational therapy and the administrative needs. Use it for your distance learning, as I will go into shortly. But what we're doing with the Department of Defense is we are taking one of the military tertiary care centers that happens to be Eisenhower Medical Center in Fort Gordon, and we are adding a consultative site to that facility. But now when military personnel in the state get sick, instead of having to be transported to one of the military facilities, they will simply walk into one of those 59 plus civilian sites They'll walk into the rural hospital, they'll walk into Dodge County Hospital, but be seen over the telemedicine infrastructure by the military subspecialists at Eisenhower Medical Center. We're just integrating in all the healthcare needs of the state onto a single backbone. The VA hospital is now debating. They want to do the same thing in the state. They're just looking for the funding to put in the equipment if they wait a couple of extra months, they'll have the funding because the cost of this technology is just de-escalating very, very rapidly. Now, the other thing I need to point out is that we insisted that the communication infrastructure that supported telemedicine be exactly the same infrastructure that supports our distance education network. And our distance education network is growing Dramatically. We have one, over 180 active K-12 classrooms 
and also community colleges in this, we will have by the end of next year, it's just been increased, there are going to be 320 distance learning sites in the state of Georgia. What we are going to do is piggyback onto the distance education system with our Department of Pediatrics and our Preventative Health Care Institute in the department. And we're going to go into our kids' classrooms. And at the same time that they're learning advanced algebra and Japanese, we're going to teach them health care. We're going to talk to them about safe sex. We're going to talk to them about AIDS and about cigarette smoking and about proper nutrition. And we're going to demonstrate to them and show them the hearts of young kids who have died in automobile accidents and show them the beginning of coronary artery disease by the age of 10 or 11. That's when coronary artery disease begins. That Big Mac they're holding in their hand for lunch, they can't get away with. These are some of the things we're going to do because we have a passionate interest in starting a preventative health care initiative in the state. If we're going to do anything about health care costs, we better start with our kids. Now, what I've just described for you is just phase one. It's a hospital-to-hospital -hospital system. And let me give you an analogy of what our phase two and phase three programs that we're going into, and we're going into in parallel, will be. And why I think what I've just described to you is the least important phase of what we're doing. When my parents were first married, they told me of what existed for them in New York City uh, in the early 30s. They lived in a three-story apartment building. And in that, there was no elevator. And in that apartment building, there was one telephone. And that telephone was on the ground floor, stuck up on the wall in the hall. And when the telephone rang, hopefully a neighbor on the first floor ran out, answered the phone, and yelled upstairs, it's for you. Telephone technology in those days consisted of a single line coming into a, an apartment building. The telephone was big, it was expensive, it had a lot of maintenance problems, and of course it was a party line. Everybody had that one line. Well, when telephone technology and telephone use really took off was when multiple lines went into that, that building. And every apartment now had its own individual telephone, and each phone was a private line. Well, where we are today in terms of telemedicine in the state of Georgia is we are still back at the stage that my parents were in in the early 1930s. There was a single telemedicine room on one of the floors in the hospital or in the clinic, and everybody's got to come to that phone. Everybody's got to come to that telemedicine room. Well, in an academic medical center like the Medical College of Georgia, that's not really an inconvenience for the doctors because the majority of the physicians have their offices in the hospital. But you go to your secondary care facilities, you go to your primary care facilities, and even if the doctor's office is across the street from the hospital, it is an incredible inconvenience for them to leave their office where they have patients sitting in the waiting room to go over to the telemedicine room at the hospital or the healthcare facility to interact on a telemedicine project, telemedicine consultation. These single room systems are still important for the hospitalized patients, but where we need to migrate and where we are going to see telemedicine really take off on a day-to-day -day basis and be utilized is the migration of the technology literally to the desktop of the physician. And let me tell you once again, this technology now is almost off the shelf. And we have alpha tested this technology already. This is a multimedia platform that sits on the doctor's desk. It's the best PC. It's the best video conferencing module. It's the best fax and the best phone, all integrated into one comprehensive multimedia platform. Compact and on the desk. Not big monitors that have to be wheeled around, but right here on the doctor's desk. And the doctor in his office or at home 
will be able to examine their patients at the hospital without going to the hospital, will be able to examine their patients, as I will show you shortly, at home. And most importantly, from the standpoint of the economics of this country, one of the most significant economic export items that has been totally untapped will be the exportation of our medical expertise abroad with this distance transparent, distance insensitive technology. And this is phase three. And phase three is occurring in parallel with phase two and as part of the funding which we got a month ago from the Department of Defense to incorporate them onto the civilian hospital to hospital backbone. They are also partners with us in the phase two and phase three component to bring medical care to where the point of need is. Point of service has got to be at the point of need. We expect it in every other aspect of our life. Why shouldn't we expect it in healthcare? And in fact, it can be done from a technological standpoint very easily. Whether you're talking about ISDN capability or whether you're talking about cable capability. And recognize that the cable that now brings you CNN and HBO in your home tomorrow, I can make totally interactive. Or if you have ISDN capability, I can make your TV or I can provide you this system in a totally interactive format. So you will turn past the home shopping channel to the home medical channel, and there will be your healthcare provider seeing you, talking to you, you seeing and talking to him, and his being able to examine you. Very simply, through what are called RS-232 ports, they're standard types of input devices, we can integrate in an electronic stethoscope, an electrocardiogram, a digital blood pressure cuff, a pulse oximeter to clip onto your index finger to assess your blood oxygen, digital spirometry to assess your pulmonary functions, and what is called an ISTAT blood chemistry system, with, which with a single drop of blood, which you know the diabetic now, uh, takes that single drop of blood at home to assess their blood glucose, we now not only can get your blood glucose, we can get your electrolytes, your hemoglobin hematocrit, your pH, and your pCO2. And why in the world would we do this? Well, the real question is why in the world haven't we done it? The fascinating thing is to actually analyze the way we deliver health care and why we haven't laughed at it years ago. Where do I see my patients? I see them in my office. I see them in a hospital bed. And the snapshot period of time that I see them is maybe for 15 minutes to a half an hour. And yet, based upon that single snapshot, I decide what medication I'm going to give that individual for their elevated blood pressure. How in the world do I know that blood pressure reading that I get in the office in which this patient may be very uptight about the fact that I'm taking their blood pressure and they're worried about it. Or they may be very relaxed now that they're not at work and their blood pressure is actually abnormally normal from what it would be were they at work. How do I know what I'm getting in that single snapshot has any relevance to the true medical condition of that patient? I don't. If I actually add up the amount of time I spend with my patients over their entire lifetime, is probably only about 40 to 60 hours. And if you think that's conservative, double it, triple it. It's still a small amount of time relative to your lifetime. I've got to begin to see you in the real world. I've got to see what your home environment is like. Because that is critical in terms of my assessment of what's going on with you. Let me give you a classical example, and let me tell you what we're doing. We're going into 25 homes in the greater Augusta area. Half of them will be military, half of them will be civilian. 
These are patients with who we call revolving door patients. These are patients with chronic illness with frequent acute exacerbations. Patients with severe heart disease, patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, patients with very severe asthma, patients with diabetes, patients with end-stage liver disease. And let's assume this is a patient with severe asthma who two weeks ago was in the hospital emergency room in what we call status as managed. That is severe asthma where the patient is an extremist and has to be intubated and sent off to the medical intensive care unit and usually requires a 10-day hospitalization at a minimum average cost of about $25,000 per hospitalization. And this is the third time or fourth time this year this patient has been in the ER in the same condition. Well, what if we put in this electronic house call system and a few days after discharge, I start to examine this patient at home. And I notice with my electronic stethoscope that I begin to hear some wheezing in the lungs. And I put on the pulse oximeter and I notice that the patient's blood oxygen level is decreasing. And I do a very simple pulmonary function test and notice that her airway resistance is going up. I know this patient is beginning to develop bronchospasm, wheezing, and within a week, a week and a half, this patient will be in severe respiratory failure in my emergency department. Well, the minute I see her at home, I can start her off on a simple medication called prednisone, by mouth, or aerosolized, and this patient will not be in my ER intubated a week and a half from now. But perhaps more importantly, by seeing this patient at home, I will find out something I never ever knew when I traditionally saw her in my office. Because while she's here, she is sitting on this great big puffy chair. And there's a doily on the armrest, and there's a great big thick rug, new rug, she just put in. And there's a cockroach scooting across the rug. And as part of the interior decorations of the hull, of course, she has some very nice plants on the back of the chair. And her husband is standing at the kitchen door with a cigarette in his mouth. And she, of course, is telling me her story while she's petting her cat. Now, for those of you who are not allergists, let me tell you that this woman is living in an explosive environment. Every single potential antigen that she could be reacting to in terms of giving her asthma, she has in her home. And by the way, one of the reasons we're seeing so much more morbidity and mortality to asthma today is based upon societal progress. The progress is that architects have figured out a way <coughs> to keep our homes more airtight. Well, by preventing air from coming in, they're also preventing air from going out. And therefore, all the concentrated antigens that now used to be diluted by the exchange that occurred in our most poor construction now no longer occurs, and there is a huge buildup of antigenic concentration within our modern homes. Now, we are concerned about some potential uh, technological problems with the system. <laughs> Someone in the audience in Tampa a few weeks ago said, how did they know it was their neighbor? <laughs> well, if I hadn't lost my credibility before, this should do it. But let me also tell you, this can happen within a year. And the reason for it, and I call this my ATM squared slot. By the way, you know, we've all become accustomed to the fact we walk, walk up to this automatic teller machine, any place in the country, and it gives us immediate access to our funds. And the reason it does is it has our financial records any place that we go up to an ATM machine. 
Isn't it interesting that nobody has pushed to have that same system exist for our medical records? It shouldn't matter where we are, whether we're in the doctor's office or in the hospital, whether we're here in Oklahoma or we're in Georgia. We ought to have access seamlessly to our medical records. And we ought to be able to walk up to our ATM machine, and the ATM machine will say, is this a financial transaction or a healthcare transaction? And you'll push healthcare transaction. It'll ask you to put in your PIN number. It will have immediate access to your medical records. And then, of course, it will ask, are you FIFA service or HMO? But through another ATM technology, something that Southwestern Bell is now experimenting with, called asynchronous transfer mode, ATM, which will really totally revolutionize telemedicine and all of our communication modalities, very short. The asynchronous transfer mode will bring the bandwidth to this monitor so that your doctor, in the same way we were able to see that doctor at home, you will see the doctor in the little healthcare kiosk at the shopping mall. You get some chest pain at the shopping mall, you can immediately go to that healthcare kiosk and be examined by the physician. I might point out to you, you're probably already aware of this, that that type of bandwidth already exists in terms of banking. Because with a number of banks around the country, if you walk up to their ATM machine, and you want to actually see and talk to a bank teller, you can. You will push a button, and they have the bandwidth right there, so you will see and talk to a bank teller 100 miles away. Well, I guess the best thing to do in terms of giving you an overview of this is probably to end with some commentary from the person that I consider to be perhaps the greatest 20th century philosopher, Gary Larson. And I guess in Oklahoma, showing Buffalo is appropriate. I anticipate that within the next 10 years, the way we deliver health care in this country will be totally changed. Most of healthcare will, will be delivered to and from the home. And in fact, the primary provider of healthcare within 10 years should be the patient. We will provide you access to immediate information resources. When you realize that 80% of patients who now see physicians have self-limited illness for which they never needed to see a healthcare provider in the first place, and the flip side of that coin is that 60% of patients who did need to see physicians delayed their care. You can see the, the need, the desperate need, to provide more capability to the patient at home. And I will tell you that for those of you in the audience who feel that this is futuristic, let me tell you that the entertainment industry will drive this into your home. It won't be the healthcare industry that's going to drive the electronic house call into your home. It's going to be the entertainment industry. They're doing it now. In California, Pacific Telesis with AT&T are putting fiber into every single California home, every single residence. And the TCIs and the Time Warners and the Southwestern Bells and the entertainment industry are driving that bandwidth into the home because you will become accustomed to, you will demand interactive banking at home, interactive shopping at home, interactive commerce at home, interactive education at home. So your children will never probably walk into a classroom again. They'll be able to walk into any classroom virtually, any place they want to with this interactive system. And the healthcare delivery system will simply piggyback on all the bandwidth that is going to be brought into your home. And don't you dare go home and tell your kids how futuristic this is because they're going to say to you, you mean that you didn't have this? And then the dinosaur jokes are going to begin. Thank you very much.
The original cost on the system in November 91 was $200,000. The cost today, in terms of setting up these uh, 59 sites, are about $100,000. And that was based upon a bid that was let a year and a half ago. If we let that same bid today, it would probably be $75,000 or less. But let me also tell you that if you had a pot of money and you had a choice between putting up these telemedicine facilities that I just showed you, even at 75,000, or to use the dollars to develop the desktop multimedia platform, I would go to the latter. Because from a use standpoint, the doctor is going to use the system when it's sitting there in his office, not when it's across the street. Now, you still don't need to develop the hospital to hospital infrastructure. So I'm only suggesting that if you only have X amount of dollars and you were given a choice between the two. But I think you still need all three components. You need a hospital to hospital system because you still have hospitalized patients who are going to need this consultative exchange. But the frequency of use will occur on an ambulatory setting from the doctor's office. Yes, ma'am. The house call will probably be about $10,000. Um, and within a few years, it should be, hopefully, about $1,000. And as the entertainment industry begins to bring that bandwidth into the home, it will probably end up being as cheap as getting a color TV. And I can also tell you that you will probably never have to pay for it. And the reason you will probably never pay for it is the fact that your insurance company, particularly if your insurance company, and they don't like to be called an insurance company, but if the managed health care industry, as they have expressed interest already in this, get involved. Because their feeling is to pay $200 for the system, or to pay $1,000 for the system, and then pay, say, $30 a month for the bandwidth to provide it to your home to keep you out of that hospital emergency department having to be intubated and sent off to the medical intensive care unit <laughs> is worth, is certainly worth it for them. And it's good medical care. So it's not only economically correct, it's medically correct. Yes, ma'am. Yes, we have a, uh, first of all, we have an elective uh, right now uh, through telemedicine, and we've had uh, students and house offices that have come through it. We just hired a full-time clinical services director from our faculty, and he will begin to um, educate uh, the physicians and uh, while we're not at the point yet to make it a mandatory uh, type of rotation, um, we're going to expand uh, the use of it. We also have uh, some uh, fellowship uh, positions, and we have uh, those uh, coming this fall. So we're starting fellowships in telemedicine. However, with that said, I'm also very concerned by what I just said. Um, I see too many people beginning to look at telemedicine as a new specialty. It's not. I hear people calling themselves telemedicalists. Well, that would be like calling yourself computerists. Um, all this is is off-the-shelf telecommunications and information processing. We're just changing the way you're communicating across a distance. Um, the telephone is a great telemedicine device. Um, that's at one end of the pendulum. What I showed you is at the other end of the pendulum. So it's really just information processing and telecommunications. I can tell you the next generation of physicians that come through won't have to go through a rotation on telemedicine. They will have learned it already. We are now making requirements. We sit on an informal task force for the NII, making recommend recommendations to them uh, for the healthcare delivery system. And one of our recommendations is as a, as a first step, all graduating medical students have got to be computer literate. As the second step, all entry um, students into medical school have got to be computer literate. And 
really that probably will be not a problem at all because look at our kids now in elementary school. They're all using computers. Um, they'll be very familiar with all this technology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sanders, for coming up today. Uh, with the representatives from Southwestern and Bell, maybe just raise your hand. We want to thank them for sponsoring Dr. Sanders for coming in. There's a couple back here. Also, we want to thank the uh, Hospitality Center here for this great meal. Not only is my head hurting from all the telecommunications, my stomach is from eating so much. Uh, we do want to get back, we need to get going on schedule so if we can go back to the other building as quick as possible. And we'll be starting. I'm going to have to leave, so y'all have a good trip. Telecommunications has told me I have to go back to the office, so thank you.